Hey guys, Dantix here, back with another Cyberpunk 2077 video. As you've, as you've probably already gathered, I'm incredibly excited for the game, and I happen to know a thing or two about the lore as well, so I thought, why not take you through the most important things you probably should know before starting a journey in 2077. Now the lore I'm about to take you through has been expanded upon in many other avenues like the Neon Arcade and the Mad Queen show, as well as sites like Netrunner2077.net, so check them out for more. Without further delay though, let's start with the world of Cyberpunk 2077 and why it is a shit show. So Mike Pondsmith, the creator of Cyberpunk, says that it isn't about saving humanity, it's about saving yourself. And this selfishness is kind of echoed throughout the entire universe with corporate greed running rampant, global catastrophes, unlivable areas of the world ravaged by both man-made and natural disasters. Cyberpunk isn't intended to be a sci-fi fantasy. It's a dystopian future in all senses of the word. What would happen if greed and excess meets technology? And honestly, guys, it feels like we're almost there. Mike Pondsmith created this universe before the technology had reached its current state, and it feels like he's almost predicted what was going to happen. Moving forward though, the CIA and other bodies came together in this universe to manipulate the stock exchange to flex America's big peen to the globe. It ended up just crashing it and the economy of many countries, simultaneously destroying the pensions and the funds of millions of Americans and turning America into a third world country. So most of the main events happen in Night City. It's a city state within America that's a launching ground for corporations and companies to enter and deal with America without actually entering. It can't be understated just how dangerous this city is. People can legally be armed to the teeth and it's made up between the poor and extremely desperate and the rich with a lot to lose. There's no middle ground. The middle class has essentially been eradicated. Look, corporations fight over control and America is no longer a superpower. Life is generally pretty goddamn terrible. Now I'll give you an example. You can buy guns from a freaking vending machine and families take home disposable ones during their weekly grocery shop. There's a local ripper dock on every corner able to replace your bits with cyber bits like it's a standard tooth extraction. There are cyborgs walking around that can snap at any moment enter a state of pure rage called cyber psychosis. The media tries to not much success, expose and combat corruption, but it's it's more or less left to the public to fight back. So enter Johnny Silverhand, our man Keanu Reeves. So who is Johnny Silverhand and why is he important to the storyline? The first thing I want to say though is that Johnny is dead. This this might confuse some of you as you've seen him in trailers. So for this to make sense, I'm going to need to take you on a journey. He began his illustrious career in the Second Central American Conflict, a war that the CIA and other puppeteers in this universe created to try and seize the Panama Canal. He and a lot of other soldiers found out the corruption of their government and deserted the war, leading him to start the band Samurai. Samurai was more or less created to wake the country up to the corruption of their government, and it was extremely successful. They produced many hits and they had a loyal fan base. However, one day their keyboarder decided to essentially kick her abusive boyfriend out a window and the band had to split up while she did time. She killed him and got three years in jail, so I guess not that much time, but Johnny used this time to relax, go on vacation, get himself a girlfriend, but eventually get jumped by a gang backed by a mega corporation that turned out to be the Arasaka Corp. It also turned out that Johnny's girlfriend was Alt Cunningham, a famous netrunner that created the Soul Killer virus, which I'll also discuss soon. And that's <laughs> that's just kind of how the future works. If a corporation wants something, they just they just take it. There's no real consequences for them for operating in the shadows as they kind of control everything. Now, naturally, Johnny's pretty pissed off because he was jumped and left for dead and they kidnapped his girlfriend. So naturally, he wants to plan a rescue. So he goes to one of his mates, Rogue, who's also his ex-girlfriend, and we get to interact with her in 2077, so expect some kind of throwback, but she's the best solo of the current time and she's an absolute badass. So her, Johnny, and a few others plan 
to raid the Arasaka Corporation. But the Arasaka Tower is essentially a fortress as Arasaka is a security company primarily, so you can't just knock on the front door. Instead, Johnny has the bright idea to bring the band back together and blast a concert on Arasaka's front doors. Johnny's a charismatic guy and that rallies the mob to riot, distracting Arasaka and allowing Johnny's team to infiltrate the building. Now, Johnny's friends get in and they find Alt, though she is midway through her own plan to escape and the infiltration increased Arasaka's awareness, so it kind of, uh, well, it kind of screwed it up for her. Her body and her consciousness were separated when Johnny found her as a result of the Soul Killer virus, something I'll discuss soon. Johnny, not really knowing anything about the Soul Killer program, picks her body up to make a swift exit, making it so her consciousness couldn't return to her body. Her body later dies. So Johnny was essentially responsible for his girlfriend's death in, in some small way, and he doesn't really get over that. So after the raid, Johnny lays low for a while in Mexico while Arasaka licks its wounds. He also takes his time to start a solo rock star career after some beef with some competitive media agencies, one trying to blackmail him, and that's a whole that's a whole other thing. But the fourth corporate war erupts and Arasaka and Militech go at each other's throats. So while soldiers are out there shooting, all of the shady shit is done by edge runners or cyberpunks as we call them. Corporations want that kind of plausible deniability for good PR, and these kinds of black op missions are best done by mercenaries. So Militech gathers two teams to attack Asaka Towers and destroy the Soul Killer virus. And you better believe Johnny Silverham was down. He'll do anything to destroy Asaka at this point. The operation was successful, but Johnny sacrifices his life to slow down Adam Smasher, a psychopathic cyborg solo that in 2077 is still at large and working for Arasaka. In 2077, we see the player install the Immortality Chip, which has a copy of Johnny's consciousness contained inside. So now we're, we're essentially up to date. There's a lot of speculation to how his consciousness was digitized, but it's thought that it was Alt Cunningham's doing and the consciousness trapped in the chip was Johnny at the time before they were attacked by Arasaka's goons while she was working on the Soul Killer virus, meaning he knows nothing of the two attacks on Arasaka Towers. And this is probably a plot device to get us to experience it with him. Now I mentioned Adam Smasher killed Johnny and he's killed many, many others, but let's find out a little bit more about this solo class psychopath. Early on, he was the leader of his local New York gang, because of course he was, and he had very little regard for human life. It led him to the army where he was dismissed, get this, for bad conduct and insubordination, which is a fancy way of saying he didn't listen and killed too many damn people for even the army. So he returned to New York and hired himself out as a mercenary, being exceedingly good at it, which attracted the attention of the corp you probably figured out is going to be the main antagonist of the game, Arasaka. Now, he did some jobs for them until he ended up being turned into Swiss cheese when the job went south. His body was cooked, but Arasaka liked him and his kind of disregard for human life, and they made him an offer. They'll replace his body with a fully cybernetic one, an operation that will cost more than even he, a successful merc, could afford, in exchange for 15 years of service. Adam, with no other choice other than to, to die, took this offer. At the end of the day, he didn't care about anything but to be the very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> he, he already thought he was better than everyone else, and he, he kind of lived to prove it. Now with his cyborg body, he's been quoted in saying, metal over meat, which is a fairly common thought process with those under cyber psychosis and uh, members of the new Maelstrom gang. You might remember them in the 48 minute demo. Now, he continued to work with Arasaka, taking jobs and being a overall ruthless asshole. That ruthlessness ended up making him a rival to one of the best solos around, Morgan Blackhand. And this leads us back to the attack on the Arasaka building, coined by Militech and led by two teams, one by Morgan Blackhand and one by Johnny Silverhand. It just so happened that Johnny, while leading the attack, finds out his lover, Alt Cunningham's consciousness, was trapped in Arasaka's mainframe just as his team meets Smash's unit. 
Now, keep in mind, he didn't know prior that Alt was still more or less alive somewhere in the net. So, in an attempt to buy time to free her, he suicidally faces Smasher. Now, this fight goes as well as you'd expect. He holds out for a little bit, but Smasher fires essentially what is a tank's cannon that blows Johnny, Johnny in half. And that's the end of Johnny Silverhand. So then a full cyborg solo from the infiltration team faces Smasher, but did you think that would go any differently? This guy's a full cyborg like Smasher is, but is utterly overpowered and destroyed like a child facing off against a full grown man inside an F-22 Raptor. Smasher rips his still alive head off and puts it in a jar to bait Blackhand into facing him. You, you remember Morgan Blackhand, right? The really good solo? Well, yeah, Morgan's kind of put off all of his challenges and just like brushed him aside like he's nothing. And that's of course pissed off the cyborg. So Morgan is at the top of the Arasaka building at this point, attempting to stop the data transfer from Arasaka to their Tokyo offices. Now, Adam Smasher comes in with the head in hand and taunts Morgan. Those two climactically battle on the top of the tower and the rest of the team escapes. Little did Adam Smasher know that Morgan Blackhand's team had placed a mini nuke in the tower and it goes off. The building starts collapsing while they're still fighting and they both fall into the fireball. Now, the fates of Morgan Blackhand, Adam Smasher and the Cyborg were relatively unknown, but then we saw Smasher in the 2077 trailer. Blackhand and the Cyborg could very well be alive too. All we know for sure is that Smasher is in the game and it's very likely that you'll have to face him. All right, so that was Adam Smasher, Johnny Silverhand and how they tie together, but the missing thread is the Soul Killer program. It's basically a program that copies a person's mind from their brain to a digital storage interface. The original would transfer the mind, leaving a husk behind that would die without the consciousness returning or without it being replaced by something else. Of course, Arasaka looked to improve and weaponize this. So what can the soul killer do? Improved versions can allow people to interrogate someone in the net, applying whatever means of torture they acquire. They can also transfer the consciousness into clone bodies for basically unlimited armies. Or you could just use the soul killer to unethically kill someone. The main reason it was developed though was to create immortality. In 2077, you have an immortality chip with the consciousness of Johnny on board. So with all the information you now know, I'll leave it to you to put two and two together with what might be happening there. So just a little bit extra before we go. When Alt Cunningham was kidnapped and forced to recreate the soul killer, she used her skills to take down Arasaka and attempt to drain their funds to escape and start a new life with a lot of money. Now, the attack on the building by Johnny and his team disrupted this plan and the soul killer was turned on her. Now, this was to erase any evidence because there won't be bad PR if there's no evidence. Now, the whole raid on the Arasaka building is left more or less to your imagination. We don't know the ultimate fate of Alt Cunningham. Did her consciousness get transferred out of the building before it was destroyed along with the data Arasaka was sending? Did Morgan survive? And what happened to the Soul Killer virus and its many versions? I guess we'll just have to play Cyberpunk 2077 to find out. So thank you so much for watching guys. Like, comment, subscribe and hit that bell button because it makes me happy and you wanna make me happy guys, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> if the game excites you, I'm still giving away copies of Cyberpunk competition is in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back very soon.